So, so as the weeks went past, what was being portrayed on the TV and the news uh, uh, and every media outlet possible just wasn't what was happening on the ground. For example, there was no increase in deaths whatsoever. This is Callum Smiles for Rebel News. And in this first part of this three-part interview with Milton Keynes undertaker John O'Looney, John takes us through what he saw in the initial response of the COVID-19 pandemic. We all had questions and concerns, but what exactly did John see? Was it the devastation that was portrayed on TV, or was it not? Here's the interview. So I've come here to Milton Keynes to meet John O'Looney, a funeral director of many years' experience, to give us his account of the past couple of years and some of the alarming things he's found whilst at work. So John, tell us who you are and explain what it is you do. Hi, so um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's John O'Looney. I run a Milton Keynes based funeral service. I've been a funeral director for 16 years. Um, 10 of those were spent working for Cooperative Funeral Care, one of the biggest funeral providers in the industry. Um, and then six years ago, I left funeral care and uh, started up on my own um, to run my own funeral home. So what's the process when, you know, a body comes to you? So initially, um, it, it starts with a phone call, generally. Sometimes you'll get a cold call and somebody will just knock at the office door, but generally the phone rings, um, you get someone who's very tearful and upset, tell me they've lost a loved one, and I then stand over the diary and make um, time for them to pop in and see me if the, the loved one has passed away in hospital or if it's perhaps someone that's passed away at home. Um, I get details of the address to go and attend and recover that deceased and convey them back to the funeral home. Did the process change when you know, the pandemic started? Were you given different directives as to how you can operate? <laughs> well, it was actually laughable. So um, nobody gave us any directives whatsoever because nobody really knew what they were doing. Um, I was asking for directives. Um, I wasn't getting them. And then in around May, I received an email from Thames Valley Police Commissioner um, instructing me that doctors would not be attending deaths. Um, we were told this was to protect the NHS um, and that police would not be attending, um, again, to protect, protect the police um, um, from this deadly pandemic. And that as a funeral director, I would be attending. Um, I would have to declare death. Um, and if I had any suspicions of any foul play, to then notify the police and they would become involved um, in that instance. Now, I'm not qualified to declare death. You know, that's the job of a doctor. So I kind of emailed back and said, look, I'm not entirely happy with this. Um, that's your job. Um, and, he's, and the response I got was, we're, we're all in it together. You know, we're like, OK, well, clearly, if I'm the only one attending and being asked to do all this, we're not all in it together. Um, and also, if you picture the scene, if I attend um, a, a residential address and there's been a death of a senior family member or any family member, and there are a large number uh, of people who are perhaps quite animated. Some of them might have been drinking. Um, you know, and I see a bit of blood on the pillow uh, and I have concerns. Am I then going to tell them I'm not going to pick their loved one up and I have to call the police? And, and, you know, it's a position that you shouldn't be putting funeral directors in. And it's not my job. It's not my job to certify death or declare death. Um, I can't certify. I can only declare. Um, and I shouldn't be put in that position. I wasn't willing to be put in that position. I told this Thames Valley Police Commissioner exactly that. Did you fear for your own safety? Because like we were told, literally anything and everything is contagious and just yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, the first kind of twelve weeks, I was frightened to death. You know, why would you not be? You're being shown pictures um, of people falling over in the streets in, in China. Uh, and, you know, uh, we're told that here's this deadly pandemic that, that targets the lungs um, and it's going to kill everyone. And uh, I'd also attended a hospital um, in uh, the first week of December of 2019. Now, that was quite interesting. I had a family come to me who'd lost a loved one. They said um, that the hospital wouldn't allow them to see their loved one in the hospital. This was before COVID was even mentioned. So I said, well, don't worry, you know, I'll go and pick this loved one up. I'll get them back to the funeral home promptly. You can see them. It's not a problem. And when I went there, I happened to mention while I was collecting this deceased, um, the family said you wouldn't let them see him. Why is that? You know, I thought perhaps I had building work done in the viewing room. And, uh, and they opened the viewing room door 
uh, into the chapel of rest, which every mortuary and every hospital has a, an attached room for people to go and see a loved one. You know, so they'll die on the ward. They'll come down to the mortuary, and then a family member, if they ask, they can go and see him in the chapel of rest. Um, and they opened the door for this viewing room after me asking why they weren't allowing it, and there was an inflatable pandemic tent in there, and I was, okay, what's that for? Um, and they said, they were told that something very nasty was coming. They didn't use the word COVID, but that was when I was first made aware. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was, that's what happened there. So what changed for you in your head when you started to think, something's not quite right here? It just wasn't, so, so as the weeks went past, what was being portrayed on the TV and the news uh, uh, and every media outlet possible just wasn't what was happening on the ground. For example, there was no increase in deaths whatsoever. What we were seeing was increasing amount of people being labelled as a COVID death who'd had cancer or had dementia or had a heart attack. There was no actual increase in numbers. There was a decrease. There wasn't any, for example, I've been a funeral director for 16 years. There wasn't a single winter flu death. That's the first year ever in 16 years. Every one of them was relabeled as COVID. Uh, and then I took a phone call from a guy called John, um, who uh, said that he worked, he was a government sponsored guy working for, a, I believe it was called Pandemic Resilience, was the company that had been formed. And his job was to call all of the funeral directors in my area. Now, I hadn't quite seen through it yet, but I was kind of thinking, this is, you know, we're not seeing the death rate. Um, uh, and wondering when I was going to get ill, for example, and I wasn't getting ill. Uh, and I kind of said, so uh, how can I help? And he said, well, the government have sponsored us, and my job, he said, is to call all of the funeral directors, um, I assume in this area, um, and I'm going to call you every Monday, I'm going to ask you a number of questions. Okay, and I was happy to help, you know, because you think like you're doing your bit. Uh, and I kind of said, so what do you need? And he said, I need to know your um, capacity, how many deceased can you hold? I need to know who you've picked up from uh, uh, that week and from where and how many are COVID. Sensible questions, but, you know, I was kind of, okay, no problem. So he would call me every Monday and I would furnish him with these figures. Um, but almost straight away, the guy started steering me uh, and alarm bells started ringing. And by that, I mean, the conversation would go, for example, I went to a care home and you have to remember, he briefed me on the information he wanted. So I was making extra effort to ascertain the status, the COVID status, especially of everyone that I picked up. Now, doctors weren't attending. There was no COVID test present. I was going to care homes and collecting people. I would tell him I picked a gentleman up who'd died from um, dementia. He'd been in the care home five years. I'd spoke to staff. They'd confirmed that. I had, I'd looked at his records that they'd supplied me with. I'd spoke to the family. They confirmed he'd... Uh, had onset dementia for five years. He was in the classic fetal position. There was no doctor present. There was no COVID test done. He wasn't a COVID death. He would insist this guy was a COVID death. So I kind of, well, John, I've just told you, I've made the effort to find out um, he wasn't a COVID. He said, well, oh, we were told that one person in that care home had died from COVID. And this is a care home of 350 residents. Every one of them who died was labelled as a COVID death because of uh, the alleged death of one of them from COVID. And this went on rinse and repeat throughout 2020. The entire duration of 2020, everyone that got on an ambulance, um, I think it was the BMC or the BMJ, whoever run them, instructed all their staff to label everyone as a COVID death. So you Regardless. have straight from the government's mouth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Basically admitting they are hyperinflated. Yeah, of course. Statistics. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Because because of the deadly danger of COVID, everyone was labelled a COVID. And, and what that meant was uh, there, there was uh, there was a brief blimp in between March and April when um, Matt Hancock had all the elderly from hospitals transferred into care homes and they all died suddenly. And they were all labelled as COVID. I never once saw a doctor on site. I never once saw a COVID test, but they were all COVID deaths. And this was at the same time that the government purchased between 300% and 1,000% more midazolam. And you saw all that with your own... Yeah, own yeah, of course. I saw discarded files of midazolam sitting in bins and on a bedside cabinet. So I know exactly what called them. I spoke to many care staff who tell me what was going on. They'd have a visiting nurse who would inject these residents and they'd die shortly after. So I've seen, like... The articles written about you, because many people think, oh, he's just a, a, an anti-vaxxer, a conspiracy yeah. theorist, a COVID <laughs> denial. I mean, you know, you believed there was a pandemic. Yeah, 100%. Why would you not? I was this. frightened to death. And, and I can tell you, I've travelled 
to Thailand, I've traveled to Africa, I've had every jab that I've ever been offered. Why would you not? Why would you not? But this, um, it was different, it just didn't feel right. And I guess I kind of erred on the side of caution just to see because as soon as this guy started labeling people with COVID, and you have to remember that by March, when this guy rang me, they were still focusing on the most vulnerable, weren't they, the 50s, the 60s. Um, and it just, you know, it just didn't feel right. Um, and then as time went on, um, I mean, throughout 2020, there was no increase in death rate apart from a brief spat in, in March and April of 2020 that I suspect was primarily midazolam. They needed to generate numbers to convince people there was a pandemic. So November and December came by. We were doing funerals no more than usual. No more than usual. And I'd hasten to add, I was washing and dressing all of these people throughout 2020 when no one else would. So I would take these people out of body, ba out of body bags. Um, they would be swimming in fluid. Um, I would wash them, dress them, and treat them with the respect that they deserve because these people were losing loved ones over a Zoom call. You know, that's not acceptable. And I wasn't willing um, to work like that. And I kept mer um, waking up every morning thinking... Well, I wonder when I'm going to get sick. I wonder when I'm going to get sick, you know? Um, and it wasn't happening. So I kind of knew in my heart. And then they, um, uh, the massive effort they were making to, to deliberately label everyone as a COVID death, that they just weren't COVID deaths. And obviously you now have, you were talking about, you have now started to see an increase in death in people you shouldn't be seeing. Death. I started seeing that from um, the moment they put needles in arms. So... 2020 came and went and, and we broke up for Christmas and there was no increase in death rate apart from that brief blip exclusively in care homes. Um, and that was unnatural and that was midazolam. I know it was, it's commonly known. Um, so I kind of suspected the death toll would increase significantly. They widely advertised here they were going to start giving people these vaccines from January the 6th locally in Milton Keynes. It varied from place to place. Um, and lo and behold, the moment needles went in arms, there was an avalanche of phone calls. Um, it was all of the elderly, the people we were told were most vulnerable and were most likely to die from COVID. They were all labelled with COVID. None of them had COVID. They didn't have COVID. They were labelled with COVID. Um, and it was jab recipients that were dying exclusively. And as they went down the ages throughout 2020, they did the 70s and the 60s and the 50s, and they kept moving the goalposts, didn't they? It's only one jab, only for the most vulnerable and no, oh no, we're going to do the, the 60s, or the 50s, or the 40s, the 30s. You can't travel, you can't see your family, you can't work. And now they're looking at doing babies. Then it's two jabs, and it's three jabs, and it's four. Well, as they went down and kept moving the goalposts, we kept seeing younger and younger people dying. And, and to give you an idea, I worked for the co-op there. I did nearly 10 years there. They're a major funeral provider. They, um, I, I could count the, uh, the, the hub that I worked in was probably did around seven, 800 funerals a year. And I could count the amount of people on one hand under 40 who would die. And it would primarily be from, and I'm talking pre-COVID, it would primarily be from um, RTA, uh, road traffic accident, because youngsters drive too fast. Um, drug overdose, because youngsters like taking cocaine and ecstasy and heroin and stuff. Or suicide, where they broke up with a girlfriend, it was the end of the world, and they killed themselves, you know, or their wife had left them. Or, or uh, so, so five, less than five a year. I see now more deaths uh, than that in a month sometimes as a small funeral, family funeral. Your own eyes. Yeah, yeah, well, they come through here. I mean, on Saturday, I looked after a 41-year-old do you know, who, who'd had developed loads and loads of blood clots after a vaccination. And in fact, it was very compelling because her husband um, asked if he could, well, I actually offered, we have a spare seat in, in the hearse. Um, so there's my colleague who's the embalmer and my wife drives the hearse and I sit next to her because I had direct, so I have to get out and page. And, and there was a spare seat and I kind of sensed that this guy wanted to ride with his wife, you know. Um, so, so I don't push, I, I don't do a hard sell on anything. You know, I, I, my opinion is if you're able to drive, drive because a limousine is an expensive taxi, for example. You know, it's not an approach most people do because they like to get as much as they can out of them. Well, for me, I said to this guy, come and ride with me in the hearse. You know, you can ride from your house to the church and then from the church to the graveside. And he was happy to do that. And he started opening up and he told us the story. So she'd been um, uh, vaccinated several times because she was told she was vulnerable. And shortly after her last jab, she developed loads of blood clots and died. And that's what killed her. And this is a woman of 41 who leaves a child of seven and another one of 13. You know, it's not an isolated incident. This isn't one in a million. My phone goes 
constantly with people that are having a negative experience, uh, um, an adverse reaction, or they've lost their dad, or they've lost their mum shortly after it being done. You know, these are not one in a million. I'm a small family funeral director, and I can see it clearly. You know, um, uh, so, so, so that's, that's why I've kind of been very outspoken, because I don't want people to die. The people I want to look after, ideally, in an ideal world, there's no shortage of work of 70, 80, 90 year olds who've had a full life. Um, that's who I want to look after. I don't want to be looking after people in their 20s and 30s and 40s. And I've seen so many of them, it's beyond belief now. And only since the vaccine rollout, and every one of them has been vaccinated. So there you have it. John was in the perfect position to see the waves of deaths which didn't come in during COVID-19. But what he does know is that this started happening once the jabs were rolled out and it's the vaccinated that were having adverse reactions and dying. Make sure you come back for parts two and three of this interview. Thank you. If you found that interview informative and you'd like to see more, head over to ukreporters.co.uk where we cover a wide range of subjects. That's ukreporters.co.uk. Thank you.